Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're going to wait just a minute or two and let everybody trickle in and then we'll get started. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. All right, if you're just joining us, we're going to wait about one more minute and then we'll get started. Thanks so much. All right, well, it's a big group, so I'm anticipating a lot of questions today. So let's get us started so that uh, we have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. Happy Friday afternoon, everyone. My name is Hana. I'm a media officer with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Thank you for joining us for a webinar today about the report that was released yesterday titled Increasing the Utility of Wastewater-Based Disease Surveillance for Public Health Action, a Phase Two Report. You can download a copy of the report and other supporting materials at www.nap.edu. A recording of this webinar will be available in the coming weeks on the National Academies website. For those of you not familiar with the U.S. National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, we are private, nonprofit institutions that provide independent objective analysis and advice to the U.S. to solve complex problems and inform public policy decisions related to science, technology, and medicine. For each requested study, panel members are chosen for their expertise and experience and serve pro bono to carry out the study's statement of task. The reports that result from the study represent the consensus view of the committee and must undergo external peer review before they are released, as did this report. We have several members of the committee with us here today to discuss the report, but before I turn it over to them, I wanna go over a few reminders. Please note that this webinar is scheduled to last one hour. We'll start off with a presentation summarizing the report by the committee, and then we'll open it up to any questions you may have. To ask a question, simply click Q&A at the bottom of the screen and type in your question. You can submit a question at any time during the presentation. And given the large volume of attendees, we may not get to every question, um, but we'll try our best to summarize and get to as many as we can. Now I'd like to introduce Guy Palmer, the chair of the committee who, that wrote the report. He is a member of the National Academy of Medicine and holds the Jan and Jack Crichton Endowed Chair at Washington State University, where he is Regents Professor of Pathology and Infectious Diseases. Diseases. <laughs> thank you so much, Guy. I'll pass it off to you. All right. Thank you, Hannah. And uh, good afternoon, um, everyone. Good morning if you're still in the Pacific time zone or, or good evening if you're joining us uh, from outside of the country. Um, I am pleased to, to have the, the public interest uh, in this report because obviously the goal of wastewater based surveillance is to inform the public and inform public health action. So as Hannah mentioned, I will go through for about the first 25 to 30 minutes, giving an overview of the report and then uh, have time for questions. All right. Slight delay in the slides. Okay. Uh, just to get started, to make just one moment. I've got to get used to the delay of when I press the button and when something happens. All right. Um, so to get started, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, talk about what wastewater surveillance is. And basically what's done is uh, samples of untreated municipal wastewater, that is what's coming into a wastewater treatment plant, is collected. And there's various ways to collect um, these samples, and I'll talk about that uh, briefly as we get into the details. But this really reflects uh, what the community has shed into the municipal wastewater stream, and so that um, obviously includes uh, feces, 
but also things such as urine, saliva, um, and skin from the entire uh, population that, that is in that what's called a sewer shed. Um, that includes residents, obviously, within those communities, but also people who come into those communities uh, daily or, or periodically, be that for, for work, for education, um, it could be for a sporting event. So it collects this really aggregate data from those individuals within the community sewer shed. That um, sewer, um, that, that wastewater sample is then analyzed for what are called biomarkers of infection uh, shed by individuals who, who are infected. So what a biomarker means in this case is, is if we look at the example of, of COVID, um, we're not actually isolating the virus itself. What we do is we take a small part of that viral um, RNA, and that's actually amplified and analyzed. So it gives us an idea of what the burden of, in the example of, of COVID-19, what the burden of that virus is within that community, but we're not actually um, isolating the virus itself. So the National Wastewater Surveillance System was launched at, as a result of the pandemic in terms of an emergency response that, to give information on what was occurring at the community level. One of the advantages of uh, using wastewater as, as a source of information is that it's independent of health-seeking behavior, whether people go to, to a clinic or not, um, and it's, it's independent of um, the means of people to afford healthcare. So if you just think personally, very early in the pandemic, when you got a test result, uh, that was then reported into the public health system. But today, when you get a, if you test yourself at home, that information is not uh, transmitted into the public health system. So what wastewater does is provides what's happening in, in that community level and gives us an assessment of risk at that time. So as of April 2024, it covers about a third of the country um, in terms of population. And I'll talk about that distribution, which is a bit uneven of the population that's actually uh, sampled in the wastewater system. It includes data, data from the wastewater scan, which is separate of the CDC, but the data comes into the same national reporting system. It's a philanthropically supported effort. I'll talk a little bit about that. And we did go into some detail about how their uh, efforts are improving the National Wastewater Surveillance System in the report. CDC and the federal government provides funding uh, for this, data aggregation and communication, and support for coordination and collaboration, including centers of excellence to continue to improve this National Wastewater Surveillance System. So as Hannah mentioned, this is a two-phase um, study. The phase one was, re was released in December of 2023. And what, what the committee really looked at there was the value of wastewater surveillance during the COVID-19 pandemic. Then the committee went beyond that and said, based on what we've learned from COVID-19 and the value of that, what would a robust national uh, wastewater surveillance system look like? And really we looked at at five key pillars of those. And those have remained as we've gone into phase two of this study. And the first is that waste to, to have a national wastewater surveillance system, it needs to be equitable. That means it needs to provide public health information across the country. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as, as we go forward in different risk profiles. Um, it needs to be integrated. And by this, it's meant that wastewater surveillance data, although it's really important as it's independent of health seeking behavior it's most valuable when it's integrated with other data so think of hospitalization rates as an example or the the usage or capacity of of icu um, intensive care unit uh, beds within hospitals so it integrates with other health system data critically wastewater surveillance data has to be actionable there has to be a health system public health action using this data in order for it to have its, its optimal value. It clearly needs to be sustainable and it needs to be flexible. That is able to adapt to new challenges. And we'll talk a little bit about how having a functional system does allow that flexibility for the future. So in phase two, we've really um, 
within the committee just drill deeper on uh, what those opportunities and barriers are to really have a robust national wastewater uh, surveillance system, looking at the technical constraints and opportunities associated with sampling, testing, and data analysis. So think of it as how we move from this pandemic response into a truly robust national system. And there's research development and information sharing needs that are critical parts of making that system uh, meet its optimal um, uh, goals. So the way the study process worked, as Hannah mentioned, this is a peer reviewed consensus report. That is, it goes out for independent peer review, but it's based on information gathering meetings with everything from local municipalities to state and regional um, healthcare uh, uh, jurisdictions to meeting with the CDC and other experts within this area. The committee had some assumptions. The first is that there would be continued budgetary support for the program. We didn't specify what that amount would be. Obviously that's beyond the remit of the committee, but the assumption is that there would be um, continued support over a period of time because many of these recommendations and development of an optimal wastewater surveillance system will require multiple years. And the committee understood that that would be required to fully maximize uh, the, rec the value of the recommendations that, that were made in the report. So the committee membership, um, just want to emphasize two things. Um, one, Hannah already did, uh, is that all of the committee members serve pro bono. Uh, they all have expert, uh, um, other professional activities, and that they do this is really a credit to their um, dedication to the National Academies process and in, and in improving public health. Um, we have experts everywhere from those individuals who understand the inner workings of a municipal wastewater surveillance, uh, a, a, a municipal wastewater um, facility through the laboratory analysis to detect those biomarkers of infection, then how that data is aggregated, communicated, ethical considerations about how that data is handled, all the way through how that information is um, presented back to the local health jurisdictions and to the public. The members um, highlighted here in yellow are members who are with us uh, this afternoon will, and will be helpful in answering the questions that you may have uh, after this presentation. So the overarching mess messages of the committee is that wastewater surveillance does strengthen the nation's ability to protect public health and limit impacts from future pandemics or regional and local outbreaks. That said, the value of the data can be increased by addressing five priorities. Optimization of sampling sites to enhance sustainability and representativeness. So just think of that as what's the optimal number of sites across the nation that will provide the best data that covers, um, that covers the population. And I'll give you some examples of that. Improving the data quality and comparability. And that is essentially to make sure that what's done by one municipality in a given state can actually be compared to, to data from another municipality in, in a neighboring state. So that they're basically comparing apples to apples and, and oranges to oranges and not, not, across, uh, not at cross purposes. Supercharging data analysis, visualization and interpretation. And I'll talk specifically about that because that's actually the information that needs to flow to the local health jurisdictions and the public health officials at that local level. We talked about um, looking at the, the suite of endemic pathogens, and by endemic pathogens, I mean those that are currently circulating, known to be circulating uh, within the United States. So again, think of something like uh, the virus that causes COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, influenza, pathogens that we know uh, occur within the country and, and um, have different patterns uh, during the year. And finally, to build capacity for early detection of emerging pathogens, that is to be prepared for the next uh, pandemic threat. So rather than having to bootstrap up a system as we did in response to COVID-19, actually have a functioning system that can pivot very quickly to protecting the public. So talk a little bit about sampling uh, for endemic pathogens, learning a lot of what was done with COVID-19. 
And the first of those is, is as I've already mentioned, is sampling optimization. So just think of that in, in terms of the spatial distribution. So, so here there's two maps in the United States. Um, the top one is where the, the National Wastewater Surveillance System is currently collecting samples and analyzing data. And then below that is the U.S. population density. And if you look in general, there's a fairly close mapping between population density and the National Wastewater Surveillance System sites. The benefit of that is you're, you're covering a large amount of the population. The disadvantage is you've often, often left uh, large areas of the country um, that are not being uh, represented within the system. So just to take an example, um, and it's one I use, if you look at the, the state of Utah, you'll see there around Salt Lake City, there's, there's quite a cluster of participating municipalities. So the question becomes, do you need all of those municipalities to provide data for that region? Or could you do the same thing with a fewer number of those, which would enhance sustainability, but still maintain um, the data flow and the representativeness for those communities? At the same time, you can see in other parts of uh, the state of Utah, it's quite underrepresented. So how do we optimize so we have the best sustainability, but at the same time, the best representativeness? So there's ways to do this, uh, refining the statistical approaches, using the data we've obtained um, from COVID-19 for optimizing these sampling sites, but critically to understand and assure that we have rural representation in the system, not only from an equity lens, but as I'll talk about a little bit later, from a differential risk perspective. So sampling approaches, um, as I mentioned in the pandemic, just multiple approaches were used uh, in response to the pandemic. But in order to improve our comparability, that is to, to compare apples to apples, we really need to have representative sampling methods to improve the data quality. Um, in most cases, this would be flow weighted composite inflow or solids. And if there's specific questions about that, we can, it's in the report, but we can also discuss that after the presentation. But basically to move towards consistent sampling in order to improve comparability. So we need to understand the sources of variability due to sampling and identify the optimal sampling strategies for both current things such as SARS-CoV-2 and as well as for new targets. So we've mostly focused on the municipal level uh, wastewater treatment plants. However, there are some examples where actually sampling at the facility level, so you're actually looking at the wastewater streams out of individual facilities, can be part of a diversified approach that benefits specific populations. So an example, there's a fungal pathogen, there's a great deal of concern about uh, Canada Oris, but we know where the, the risk is highest. It, it's actually in healthcare settings. So, and that's also where you would have the actionable result in terms of, of uh, patient um, management. So the facility level for that would be the appropriate place to, to really put the, the um, intensive focus. But there's some research needs for that. Unlike a municipal wastewater treatment plant, you may be looking at semi-quantitative results or even binary results, that is presence or absence of a given pathogen that would then initiate a further response um, in terms of understanding the risk to that facility and the, and the patients and individuals within that facility. Analytical methods and quality criteria for endemic uh, organisms. So the graph here really shows one of the challenges, um, and I'm going to walk you through it just briefly. If you look on the vertical axis there, it's the logarithmic concentration of gene copies uh, per liter, and this is for SARS-CoV-2, the causative, causative virus for, for COVID-19. And then on the horizontal axis, we have different standard operating procedures. These are all done at the same plant using different standard operating procedures. And basically, if you just look at the first um, um, two standard operating pr procedures, which are listed there as 1.1 and 1.2, they're the closest to the, to the vertical axis, you can see that when, whether you're measuring two different viral targets, N1 or N2, there's basically a, a two logarithm difference in the results that are given by different standard operating procedures. So 
if different facilities are using different standard operating procedures, you can see now comparability becomes very, very difficult. So we really need rigorous data analysis uh, to improve comparability across analytical methods. And there's several ways to do to to address this. The community the committee made several recommendations um, for CDC to consider, um, which I've listed there. It could be a it is as uh, simple as requiring a standard method, but also data normalization. That is, after the data is collected, there's a way to, to then normalize that data so you're comparing apples to apples. Um, or it could be accepting all methods that perform as well as a reference method. So there's multiple ways to get at that, um, but the need for, the, for doing that is uh, a strong committee recommendation. So quality control, again, as we move from this pandemic response, um, basically wastewater surveillance needs to move much like what we'd expect from a clinical laboratory, which is standard operating procedures, performance controls, positive and negative controls, and training and proficiency testing. All of this is required to give us uh, the best data possible. So data analysis, integration, interpretation becomes really critical um, because this is actually now the information that flows down to the healthcare system and the public health um, agencies that are going to be responsible for implementing uh, public health measures. So there's really kind of six criteria here that, that we really focused on in terms of developing a robust national wastewater surveillance system. Comparability, which I've already talked about, um, and we really need analysis to resolve whether normalization improves data quality and comparability, and if so, which method to use. Integration becomes really critical, as we've mentioned, as one of our, our five pillars um, from the phase one study is wastewater surveillance data doesn't stand uh, uh, just on its own. It needs to be integrated with different clinical databases. So actually making those clinical databases talk to each other and then allow those to be visualized in, with different tools is really critical for us to get a full picture of what's happening with any given infectious diseases. And this allows us then to strengthen disease forecasting based on wastewater data combined with other uh, clinical databases. Timeliness is, is critically important, as you would imagine, um, as uh, unlike wine, uh, data doesn't get better. Uh, disease data doesn't get better with time. Um, it actually loses its value over time. So if you look at that graphic there, um, you can see that different on the vertical axis are basically different um, wastewater, um, uh, wastewater, wastewater system reporting data. And then on the horizontal axis, you can see the data lag in terms of days. So this is the, the lag between when that sample is collected and when the data is actually reported. And you can see there's both variation between uh, or, or among um, different wastewater surveillance systems, but also you can see there's quite, a, there's quite a long tail or it extends out very far to the right, meaning that in certain cases, there's a long lag between when that data is, the sample is collected, when the data is reported. So actually automating that data entry and having reporting deadlines would improve the timeliness and therefore the impact of, of wastewater data. This data needs to be made available to health departments and researchers. There's a whole treasure trove of data available, but getting that out to where uh, it can be uh, used to improve the system really requires uh, that it be broadly shared, which the committee recommended can be done through fairly simple uh, data use agreements, which, you know, still protects um, yeah, uh, privacy and ethical concerns, but allows that data to be shared broadly um, in order to improve the system. Consistent data analysis tools that contextualize risk. This is kind of where the rubber starts to hit the road um, is that uh, the system should advance plug and play uh, tools for public health agencies. Um, and doing this in the near term, it was recommended for open so source code. And if you come back to that, qu that question I raised at the beginning, how we need to enhance um, or assure that there's rural representation as we get to more rural and smaller local health jurisdictions, 
they don't have the expertise or partnerships that you may see in a large city, which are disproportionately represented within the National Wastewater Surveillance System. So actually making that easy for that local health jurisdiction, which may only have a, a very few number of individuals uh, serving actually large uh, regions of the country, making those tools optimally available to them for interpretation is, is really important. As part of that, the CDC should assist uh, the state, local, and tribal agencies to understand the significance of those changing infectious disease metrics, not just give them data, but actually provide guidance plans along with that data in a way that's easy to understand and easy to translate into action. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we the committee understood very clearly that this is going to be an iterative process to improve and maximize the value of a national wastewater surveillance system. And as part of that, there should be ongoing evaluation just to make sure that the value of the data, wastewater data integrated with other health system data is actually um, valuable and worth the burden that it may place on local public health agencies and the wastewater um, treatment facilities themselves. So much of what we've learned about wastewater surveillance has been based on the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So the question is, what other um, uh, infectious agents can be added into this system in a way that gives us valuable date, data, but also does so without burdening um, additionally the wastewater facilities and the way information flows from the laboratory, again, through data analysis and communication. So in our 2023, basically the phase one report, we looked at three criteria uh, for evaluating future targets. And we've maintained those as pillars of uh, looking at additional targets. Obviously first is public health significance of that infectious disease. Second is the analytical feasibility, meaning can you measure that or measure the biomarker for that infectious disease in a wastewater stream? And can you do it reproduce, reproducibly and accurately? And then is that data, again, by itself or integrated with other health system data, useful for action? So the committee clearly could see that respiratory syncytial virus and influenza virus could be integrated into this system, would be expected to provide useful information for minimal cost or minimal burden um, through that chain of collecting the sample, analyzing the sample, reporting the data. So they clearly met these three criteria and integrated well into a functioning wastewater surveillance system. Data was lacking for other targets in at least one or more criteria. So we, the committee looked at a large range of other infectious diseases that you could measure uh, within the wastewater stream. And currently, none of those really rose to that unequivocal uh, acceptance of these three criteria. That said, there's ongoing data collection by wastewater scan um, and additional research groups that can fill these gaps and begin to answer these this three criteria necessary for integration into the National Wastewater Surveillance System. But overall, the committee felt really strongly that improvements to data quality and comparability were more important than target expansion. And that's for the simple reason that if the only thing you're measuring is uh, SARS-CoV-2, you want to make sure that's comparable across the nation, that it's representative um, in terms of um, spatial uh, uh, representation across the country. So improving that data quality, comparability, and driving that into public health action, it's the same whether there's one target or 100 targets. And so getting it right with a minimal number of targets is the highest priority. There's a, a, a specific case for looking at antibiotic resistance genes, and these are the genes that confer on a, on a bacteria to no longer be responsive to antibiotics. Um, the committee felt that usefulness of routine community, le community level surveillance for these antibiotic resistance genes was questionable. It's quite difficult to actually correlate that data, especially how we're collecting that data today, um, to, to tie that to antibiotic resistance in a relevant pathogen. 
And secondly, there's environmental reservoirs that would confound the data. That is, there's presence within, think of with, within the sewer system that form what are called biofilms that actually harbor these antibiotic resistance genes. And therefore, what you would be measuring does not really represent what's happening in the community. And for this reason, much as we mentioned earlier in the example of the of Canada oris, the fungal pathogen, is that antibiotic resistance gene monitoring should really focus at the facility level, hospitals, nursing homes. That's where we have the most at-risk patients, but it's also where we can take uh, healthcare system action. So emerging pathogens, those pathogens that are currently outside of the United States or maybe haven't been reported anywhere, um, such as just think back to when SARS-CoV-2 first came into the United States, to have the ability to detect and respond to new pathogens um, is a critical pillar of a national wastewater surveillance system. So early detection of emerging pathogen threats, because obviously it's the earlier you catch an emerging pathogen, the better, the easier it is to control before it undergoes widespread transmission. So currently San Francisco International Airport is being used as one of the Sentinel sites to actually examine what's coming in on incoming aircraft. And the committee recommended that this approach could be used more broadly. Um, several of the largest airports that serve international uh, passengers coming in from different parts of, of the globe into the United States. The second is that um, the importance of, of targeted sentinel sites for human infections emerging from animal sources. And if we kind of go back to that idea of the spatial representation most of our intensive animal agriculture, whether it's poultry or swine or, or dairy cattle, tends to occur in rural areas. And as noted, the rural areas, they have smaller local health jurisdictions um, and are, are underrepresented within the National Wastewater Surveillance System. But you have a population there that is at greater risk for spread uh, of uh, a, an emerging pathogen into the human population. So we're not talking about sampling animals, but rather ensuring that we have representation in those areas, uh, those pre predominantly rural areas where there's um, a large um, focus of intensive animal agriculture and therefore a disc different risk profile than what we may see in an urban setting. And obviously an emerging pathogen uh, detection system has to have the flexibility to respond to localized outbreaks such as we saw earlier um, with the response to, to MPOX. The committee felt very strongly that you need to have a routine national wastewater surveillance system. That is what's working for the pathogens we know about, things such as SARS-CoV-2, influenza, respiratory syncytial virus. That has to be functioning in order to have a system that also works for rapid emergency response, because that may be national, regional, or local. And that's why that comparability and spatial um, distribution of sampling becomes so critical. So as part of the emerging pathogen surveillance, CDC should bear the primary responsibility um, for real-time data analysis and rapid response. They are the nation's public health agency. And there's certain research needs there because unlike when you're looking at a pathogen, an endemic pathogen, which we know um, what we're looking for, we're looking for trends and shifts um, in terms of, of that infectious disease burden. Emerging pathogens can be very different. We may be looking actually for a needle in a haystack. So we need to develop and improve analytical methods. We need to know what that level of sensitivity is, that at what level can we detect an emerging pathogen. We need to make sure the sentinel sites are placed optimally in order to detect um, threats coming in from different parts of the world. And finally, the committee did spend some time on exploratory research on what's called non-targeted sequencing. So what we currently do is we look for small parts of known viruses, such, such as influenza virus or respiratory syncytial virus. But it, are there approaches as, we, as the technology develops to actually look at broad viral uh, families. So for example, multiple different coronaviruses, including the ability to go in and look at what's called pathogen agnostic methods. That is, you could have systems that would detect pathogens that previously were unknown um, 
and, and for which no assays occurred, but there would be ways to actually pick these up um, using non-targeted sequencing. So to conclude our overarching met messages is the committee strongly recommended as they did in the phase one report, the importance of wastewater surveillance in strengthening the nation's ability to protect public health and limit impacts from future pandemics because it does give us an idea of what's happening at the community level. And as I've mentioned, it's independent of health seeking behavior. Um, and the value of data can be increased by, by uh, addressing these five priorities. The first three are really around improving comparability, optimizing where those sampling sites occur, and actually making sure that that data is both timely and um, facile for local health jurisdictions to interpret and move into public health action, again, in a, in a very timely manner. <clears throat> and then as we go forward, looking at it strategically expanding the suite of endemic pathogens. Currently, there was a strong case made for a respiratory syncytial virus and influenza virus in addition to SARS-CoV-2. And in doing so, we also build capacity for early detections of the next disease threat into the United States. I think that's my last uh, slide. And as noted, the recording of this presentation will be uh, posted at the study website. So with that, I think we can go to questions um, that you may have. Thank you so much, Guy. I really appreciate that great presentation to get us started. And we've had lots of questions coming in. So we'll jump right in. Um, we've got some other members of the committee here that are going to make up our panel. So thank you all for your time being here. Um, so first, to get us started, I'm going to start off with a pretty basic question, um, and that's uh, how accurate or reliable are the current surveillance results in general? Are there environmental factors that impact the accuracy of wastewater surveillance data, such as a heavy rainstorm or community size? Um, certainly that's true. I'm going to turn to one of my committee members because we've got some extra, I'm going to turn to Sandra first. I hope I'm not putting you on the spot, but I know you've done quite a bit of work on those factors, which the simple answer is yes, those factors do influence it to a great deal, but I'm going to turn it to Sandra for some, some fine detail on that. Yeah, this, the straightforward answer is that the actual value is not always being used. It's the trend in the value because the empirical number that you get in one lab versus another can be just wildly different depending on the method, the DNA extraction, the laboratory, as Guy showed the comparison of methods, you know, the exact same sample can give a different empirical value. But if you have good quality control in the lab and you're using a standard method in your laboratory, then you can reliably track the trend. So the trends for all of these are being used. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't be working towards some standardization so those empirical values can be compared um, across laboratories and across the nation. And that's where efforts like SCAN or some other research efforts that look nationally using the same method across multiple sites is useful. So you can get that national picture. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sandra. And there, there's just, as part of that question, there was a specific thing of, you know, can rainfall affect um, those levels? And obviously, when we talked about the importance of different sampling approaches and how you deal with that. So like, for example, flow weighted analysis versus if you just go in and grab a one time sample, obviously, the rainfall would really have a big effect on that, that you, that you wouldn't be able to uh, normalize or correct for. So certainly those are challenges, but they're also challenges that can be uh, addressed through through um, both research and refinement of the approaches. Thank you. I have a follow-up question for that one. And that's, so in this universal data reporting system, you know, if somebody's in Baltimore, how is the data coming out of another state like Utah, like how, how does that help inform what's happening on the other side of the country? I don't know if somebody wants to take a shot at that one. I'll, I'll take a quick shot. All right. 
So uh, I'm Scott Mashkin from the University of Washington. So um, one of the thoughts there is that really uh, each of the other areas within the country can be a leading indicator for another area. And so if you're seeing trends increase in one area, uh, you're more likely to uh, be able to prepare for that trend if it's coming your direction. So that's probably the most important way, but it's also important to consider that kind of post hoc data analysis to kind of really understand the transmission and spread of these diseases uh, requires really more of a national approach to understand the total burden. Yeah, and maybe uh, I'll take a stab at this also. My name is Ami Putt. I'm from Stanford University. Uh, I think this is uh, also a place where data integration and advances in artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, being able to learn from existing data, you know, what happens in Baltimore when we've seen similar pathogens, for example, arising in Utah, might give us some insight into potential predictions um, for future events. And so while this is very much in the research phase, uh, we tackle part of this in the report as well. Yeah, you took my next question asking about uh, the role of AI in, in integrating um, some of this data. So um, is there anything else you want to say on that before we, we move on? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, obviously we're living in an era of an explosion of capabilities from a machine learning perspective. And we, you know, wastewater is a very data rich uh, data type. Um, uh, there are obviously are capabilities for automated pattern recognition, um, for predictive modeling based on wastewater data. But I think one of the most exciting pieces of this is actually integrating wastewater data and all kinds of other data to actually inform decision making and to have even better um, predictive models. Now, the flip side of this is something that's been talked about a lot in the artificial intelligence era that we're in right now, which is, you know, your predictive models are only as good as the data that you train them on. And if we have missingness in our data, meaning we don't have equitable coverage in terms of our data, uh, then we end up with biased models. And so this is something that the committee discussed at length, obviously is not uh, an issue that only pertains to wastewater. I think we're seeing this across the board as we leverage the power of AI. Um, it has the opportunity to actually fill gaps, but it can also broaden gaps of inequity. And so it's something that we need to think very carefully about. That's great. Um, our next question is, uh, how quickly can biomarkers be developed and implemented for newly emergent diseases or pathogens of concern? What would be involved in implementing wastewater surveillance for an emerging pathogen? Um, I can take a crack at that or Ami, I saw you take your, you're off mute, so I'm going to turn back to you. Um, and, I, you know, I think from a laboratory perspective, um, for standard methods like digital droplet PCR or qPCR based approaches, um, so long as we're talking about targets, either pathogens or, for example, antimicrobial resistance genes that are DNA or RNA, um, developing and uh, characterizing a test really only takes probably a few weeks in a laboratory setting, um, setting up proper controls, et cetera. Um, but of course, one then needs to actually distribute those assays, make sure that those assays are being performed in a reliable manner. I'm sure that folks like Krista and Scott, um, who are also involved in this space, have comments that they might like to add. Sure, I can, I can add to that, Krista Wigginton. Um, so after the development of the assay, there's also, you know, to show that the levels in wastewater um, are telling you something about the infections, you often do need some clinical data to correlate or to match with, with the wastewater. And so that's oftentimes, even though the methods might work really well, and that's sometimes a barrier to being confident in the data is having that clinical data available to show that it's actually working. And, you know, just to add a bit more to this, um, we had a lot of discussion about the value of having an in-place wastewater surveillance system in a time where there's diminishing resources, you know, the question comes up, can we just scale up when we need it? And there was pretty good consensus that the adding the assay is not the difficult part. It's having the trained personnel, the laboratory equipment, the relationships between the different departments where you get the clinical data and the wastewater facilities. And that is the part that should stay in place and be running 
while we're running the endemic pathogens. So if we do need to put an assay online, it's a matter of pretty much what Ami and Krista highlighted. Get the laboratory you know, assays up and running and validate it and not try to resurrect the whole system from scratch. Now, I would really just emphasize what 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 Sandra uh, pointed out. It, it was is the importance of relationships. Um, municipal wastewater facilities were not part of the public health response system. I mean that that's that was developed in response to the pandemic, and those relationships had to be developed because obviously this is an extra burden on municipal wastewater staff, and to actually develop those relationships and those partnerships. Um, has been really critical in those places that it that it's worked best. So I, I think that's just a point that the committee was very aware of. We had that representation on the committee, but I, I just want to uh, reemphasize uh, Sandra's point of the relationships and the training to get that in place is is critical and should be maintained. So that, as you guys highlight the importance of municipal water systems, um, how would we accomplish wastewater sampling in rural areas where a lot of folks are operating on septic systems rather than connected to some kind of sanitary sewer network? I don't know if anybody wants it. I, I'll get started and then then others can, can jump in on that. Um, we, you know, we did look at... at um, we're very aware that it's about 16% of the U.S. population is not connected to a municipal wastewater um, surveillance system. They're they're on septic tanks, et cetera. Um, interesting, it's not always, uh, there's a tendency to think, you know, that always, that would be um, in a lower income community. That's not always true. It's it sometimes is the opposite of that. So it really, it spreads the gamut. The question becomes, can you capture those individuals uh, in other ways, such as, you know, do they go go to work? Are they, you know, going into into a community that does have ongoing surveillance? As I mentioned at the very beginning, the sewer shed collects everyone who comes into that community for work and um, for work, education, uh, sporting events, whatever. But the, now that the challenge is to really look at the data as a committee really emphasized, there's a rich treasure trove of data to begin to answer that question of, are you really monitoring the, that population um, or not? Are, you, are, are, are they truly missing or are you just measuring them in other ways? So others can jump in, but I think that's it. It's something the committee was very much aware of. Hi, I would I would just add in uh, Christine Johnson from UC Davis um, that that's exactly right. As Guy said, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to ensure that the system could be representative and no system, even the most robust system can be everywhere at all times. So in addition to looking at ways that we would try to capture those individuals in terms of where they go, um, from a surveillance perspective, we're, we're also looking at are there ways that we are capturing individuals like them so that we would then, from sort of an epidemiologic perspective, be able to have representativeness across the spectrum of disease distribution and risk and other profiles that are really important to measure in, in a robust surveillance system of any kind. Um, our next question is um, kind of tangentially related, but is there is there noise, you know, quote unquote noise in the wastewater surveillance from animals that can be infected with certain pathogens and viruses that also infect humans? So if so, would there be a trigger for, for viruses that might be circulating solely in animals and not actually in humans? Yeah, I'm I'm gonna come right back to to Chris on that one. That's in her expertise. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you covered it quite well in in the presentation as as well. But I I think certainly you can pick up animal pathogens in wastewater. It just depends on the extent to which there's inputs. And so from an agricultural livestock perspective, if there's agricultural inputs, you can certainly pick up um, those those targets. And and in fact. 
the wastewater system did quite readily detect H5, um, likely through agricultural inputs. You can look on the CDC website um, that those biomarkers were, were spun up and the tests um, were used by the laboratories very quickly and, and CDC's reporting um, where those, um, those positives are being detected in wastewater for, for what is um, you know, most likely a livestock um, contamination of wastewater, but wastewater is so fundamentally, um, you know, targeted towards um, what is in sewer sheds being shed from humans. So it's it's not, it's not, well, you can find this noise, it's not necessarily the most effective way to look for livestock pathogens. Of course, there's, there's much more effective ways than surveillance programs and engagement of state and national laboratories that specialize in this, um, then can get hands on um, the production animals and, and other animals that that need to have surveillance done. So um, as we've been saying, the wastewater is a complementary, really important source to detect what's circulating in humans. Um, but then we need these other um, avenues and aspects of, of surveillance to be robust as well to complement um, and, and understand this noise versus um, versus signal detection. Thank you. That that distinction. Um, I'm gonna kind of switch us over to it to a different topic, but one that everybody always has questions about, and it's what funding mechanisms are in place to ensure the continuation and expansion of this program in the in the long term. So, as I, I mentioned during the presentation, the committee did assume that there would be ongoing budgetary support because obviously to implement these recommendations will require that. Um, most of the, the funding for this has come from the federal government um, as the wastewater uh, surveillance system uh, was developed in response to the to the pandemic. Um, so going forward, because it is a public health action, um, most of that burden is going to fall on the federal government. Um, that said, there are other parts of the, the, the wastewater scan, for example, which is philanthropically supported, does provide important inputs into the system as well as there are a large number of efforts to actually look at the data and improve the system from that aspect. But the operation of the system itself is hard to imagine without um, continued federal funding. I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in. We've, all, we've already mentioned this, um, but keeping the system running at a robust baseline level I think is really important so we can use it to, you know, most effectively. And the, um, I think the report was really clear about the research needs that need to keep improving and evolving the system. We made great strides during the pandemic because of the pressure of the pandemic. So, um, but it's, um, it's not at a steady state. There are so many kind of parts that still need to be validated, data improvement, and especially, and I think Ami mentioned it a couple of times, there's so much data that's rich for research projects and, and areas of improvement. So aside from the public health side, there's really great opportunities for other agencies to fund um, research, and hopefully that will holistically keep evolving the system. I think also, as, as as the committee recommended, it it's essentially trying to come with an evidence based approach for right sizing the surveillance system. That is, how many sites do you need to really reflect what's going on? And it, as Scott mentioned earlier, to learn from what's happening in one state, if you have comparability among data, it can inform other states. So what that is that right sizing and certainly using, as was mentioned, the amount of data that's out there to find that right sizing um, not only assures that level of representation that we that we want, but it also makes it more sustainable over time if you actually diminish the costs because you're getting representative data that that's that's actually serving the public health need. There's also some opportunities in terms of automation, in terms of sampling, handling the data that would be expected to reduce costs over time. So I think while there has to be budgetary support for it, um, I think that can be right-sized and the, the recommendations of the committee um, can actually give um, accurate data and may be able to reduce costs over time as the system is streamlined. So if I could just 
build on one thing that that Sandra uh, kind of alluded to. And this is this idea that um, there are opportunities beyond just the surveillance system and a robust functioning surveillance system itself. And I think one of the issues that we had is very early on, the people first to the to the uh, uh, task were really the academics. And now as we're moving towards more this transition into the public health institutions and utilities and, and commercial interests, um, we need to be careful to really define the roles because we don't want to create a um, feeding frenzy, so to speak, where everybody is all jumping in and then there's nothing left. And I think defining those roles, we had a lot of discussion around really what was going to be the role of academics going forward. And I think there is a role and, and we discuss roles around this research and other things that I think if we define them appropriately, um, we just make sure that the funding comes in each of those areas. Um, Scott, you mentioned roles. Um, and one of our questions is about community members and what can community members do to get momentum on making changes to enact your recommendations from this report? Are there some high impact actions that community members could take to help support the implementation of the important recommendations in your report? Yeah, that, that's a really, that's a really good question and a, and a provocative question, but it, um, it, because at the end, you know, we've talked about when you talk about a national wastewater surveillance system, in the end, the action tends to be very local. So it's also where that support is going to be most effective is, is at that local level. When when we've looked through the the various um, people looking at, at wastewater surveillance data during really during the whole time that, that the committee was meeting. It was amazing the number of people in communities who are actually using that data and using that data to make decisions, decisions about travel. Are they going to get together around Thanksgiving? You know, these kind of uh, questions. So I think from a local perspective, they're going to have, that's where that data is most useful, but it's also where their advocacy is going to be most impactful um, at that at that local level, not only through your your local public health, but obviously um, in the end, um, funding for these kind of programs is is congressionally mandated. So when there's value, it's really at that grassroots level that it begins to have an impact. It's a great question. I guess I'll just follow up with that by saying I think this is really an opportunity for the public to have their voice heard um, by their Congress members, et cetera. Uh, I think not only you know voice, voices in support of wastewater-based epidemiology as a potential public health action, but also voices of concern um, also need to be shared if there are concerns around privacy, concerns around how these data will be used, um, how equitable our systems are. I think all of this information is incredibly important uh, to feed back to your you know, local Congress member, um, simply because that will enable them to make decisions around how to continue to support and, as Guy said, right-size this system. And the committee certainly is you know, responsive to additional questions that uh, individual congressmen and women have, um, the committee is very responsive to that, as is the National Academies, because in the end, that's what we want to see, see happen. So thank you. And thank you, Ami. Great. Well, we only have a, a minute left or two minutes, uh, but I'd just like to call on Guy or, or any other committee members if there's anything that um, as people, the report has only been out for about 24 hours, if there's anything else that you'd like to make sure people walk away from this webinar with, if there's any um, big takeaways that maybe we haven't gotten the chance to touch on yet. I mean, there's 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 a mountain of things in this report that, that we could touch on, but just just to kind of come back to two that we've talked about here, but I think really want to highlight is the one that Sandra brought up about the importance of relationships and making sure that that those partnerships and that training is maintained. And the second part of that is you have to have a functioning system um, in order to quickly pivot and be responsive to the next pandemic.
Great. Well, anybody else want to add anything before I, I close this out here? No, I guess just quickly, it is just highly impressive how this system got ramped up by many, um, many people across the United States that galvanized, as was said, and, and the committee just really um, was impressed and appreciated the robustness and the um, self-sacrifice that many folks had to get this system up and going in such a short period of time. And it, it, it really is incredibly promising for what it can deliver in the future, exactly to what Guy said. Um, something that needs to be done um, in the event we know pandemics are more likely emerging infectious diseases have continued even over the last several years to hit us. Um, and just uh, it's it's a really promising um, system to look forward to. That's a great note to end on. So thank you all so much. Um, thank you to all of our audience members for joining us. Thank you to the committee members for your work on the report and your time here today. Um, it's been a joy to speak with you all. Um, I would encourage everybody, I know we didn't get to all of our many, many questions, um, to go and continue to dig through the report and uh, reach out to the National Academies if you have any further questions. So um, again, uh, thank you all uh, for your time and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Hannah.